The Siege of Gibraltar of 1727 saw Spanish forces besiege the British garrison of Gibraltar as part of the Anglo-Spanish War. Depending on the sources, Spanish troops numbered between 12,000 and 25,000. British defenders were 1,500 at the beginning of the siege, increasing up to about 5,000. After a five-month siege with several unsuccessful and costly assaults, Spanish troops gave up and withdrew. Following the failure the war drew to a close, opening the way for the 1728 Treaty of El Pardo and the Treaty of Seville signed in 1729. Background on 1 January 1727 the Marquis of Pozo Bueno, Spanish ambassador to the court of St. James's, sent a letter to the Duke of Newcastle explaining why the Spanish crown believed that Article 10 of the Treaty of Utrecht had been nullified by infractions by the British. The session which His Majesty, King Philip V made precedently of that place is become null, because of the infractions made in the conditions on which it was permitted that the English garrison should remain in the possession of Gibraltar, seeing that contrary to all the protestations made, they have not only extended their fortifications by exceeding the limits prescribed and stipulated, but what is more, contrary to the express and literal tenor of the treaties, they receive and admit the Jews and Moors in the same manner of the Spaniards, and other nations confounded and mixed, contrary to our holy religion, not to mention the frauds and continual contrabands which are carried on there to the prejudice of His Majesty's revenues. The letter was tantamount to a declaration of war. Spain, however, was not in a particularly advantageous position to capture Gibraltar in 1727. At the last attempt to retake Gibraltar in 1704, Spain had a strong navy and the additional assistance of French warships. However, following their defeat at the Battle of Cape Passero and the capture of Vigo and Passages, the Spanish navy was severely weakened. The Royal Navy had complete naval supremacy in the Straits, ruling out a Spanish landing in the south, and ensuring that the British garrison would be well supplied through a siege. Also, any attempt to scale the rock from the east was now impossible as the British had destroyed the path. This narrow strip of land would come under fire from three sides, Willis's Battery to the east, the Grand Battery to the south, and the Devil's Tongue Battery on the Old Mole to the west. A number of Philip V's senior military advisers warned the king that the recapture of Gibraltar was, at the present, near impossible. The Marquis of Illidarias had warned that it would be impossible to take the rock without naval support. The senior Flemish engineer, George Prosper Verboom, agreed with this opinion, and gave it as his considered opinion that the only plan with any possibility of success was of a seaborne attack from the south. However, the king was impressed by the Count de las Torres de Alcorín, viceroy of Navarre, who vowed that he could, in six weeks, deliver Spain from this noxious settlement of foreigners and heretics. The disagreement between Verboom and de las Torres was to continue throughout the siege, indeed, so noticeably that later, when the siege was underway, a diarist within Gibraltar wrote that a Spanish deserter had reported that a dispute hath happened betwixt two generals about storming us, upon which the one is going to Madrid to complain to the king, opposing forces. Despite Verboom's doubts, the king gave de las Torres leave to attempt an assault on Gibraltar. The count began to muster the besieging troops at San Roque at the start of 1727. In total 30 infantry battalions, 6 squadrons of horse, 72 mortars and 92 guns. Large parts of the army were not themselves Spanish. Of the 30 infantry battalions, 19 were foreign mercenaries. Three battalions of Walloons, three French Belgian, four Irish, two Savoyard, two Neapolitan, one Swiss, one Corsican, and one Sicilian. Serving alongside the Jacobite Irish was the infamous Duke of Wharton, a notorious libertine, alcoholic, and founder of the original Hellfire Club. Wharton had fled England and joined the cause of the Old Pretender. He attained permission from Philip V to serve as volunteer aide-de-camp to the Count de las Torres. 
and was something of an embarrassment to both sides. The Duke of Wharton never comes into the trenches but when he is drunk, and that then, and only then. He is mightily valiant, he was to be badly injured in the leg during the siege and he was later declared an outlaw by the British government. Both the governor of Gibraltar and their lieutenant governor were in England when the Spanish began to amass their forces. Colonel Richard Kane, the British commander of Menorca, was in temporary command of the sparsely defended British garrison of approximately 1,200 men from the 5th Regiment, the 13th the 20th and the 30th, Kane expelled the 400 Spanish residents at Gibraltar and continued to improve the defences until the 13th of February when Brigadier Clayton arrived with her fleet under Admiral Sir Charles Wager and reinforcements from the 26th Regiment, the 29th and the 39th. By early February Spanish labourers had moved down from San Roque to the Isthmus and started to construct battle lines. On the 22nd of February a warning shot was fired over the heads of the working parties. The governor gave them a gun at four o'clock, by way of challenge, and, in an hour, cannonaded them very warmly, thus the 13th siege began. Gibraltar under siege The early siege of the Count de las Torres's first move was, by cover of night, to move five battalions and 1,000 working men forward to take the Devil's Tower and two other abandoned fortifications, and to dig trenches parallel to Gibraltar's walls, until the invention of the Kola gun in the Great Siege fixed artillery guns could not be depressed below the horizontal, so the Spanish working parties could not be fired upon from the north face of the rock. The Finnish trenches might have proved the attackers with a good foothold from which to assault the town. However, Admiral Wager moved his squadron out of the bay to the eastern side of the isthmus, and at point-blank range, yet beyond the reach of the Spanish guns, pounded the men with enfilade fire for three days. Inflicting on him perhaps more than 1,000 casualties, the Spaniards soon built batteries to drive away Wager's ships. But even without naval bombardment the strong winds and a heavy rain of February made digging and maintaining the trenches nearly impossible. Willis's battery, on the north face of the rock, gave the Spaniards a great deal of trouble. After a natural cave was discovered in the rock, a plan was hatched to mine under Willis's batterion, excavate a gallery 1.5 meters wide and 1.7 high to a depth of about 25 meters then a further 20 upwards, and to fill the cavity with 400 barrels of powder. This activity was noticed by and alarmed the defenders. They possessed themselves of a cave under the rock, in order to undermine it, so as to get into the town. Upon discovery, our men made a mine over their heads and blew up the rock upon them. A machine was invented to let a man down the side of the rock to spy what the enemy were doing. This was put into execution, in the night too, with no effect, for the unevenness of the rock prevented any safe decent, so that we could make no discovery how they proposed to blow it up. However, the limestone under Willis's battery was far too solid to mine easily, in less than the space of eight or ten months in a hazard whether it could be perfected even then or not, first heavy bombardment failing to create a strong stepping stone for a land assault, and lacking the means for an assault from the sea, de las Torres's only option now was to pound the British into surrender. On the 24th of March the Spanish began what they hoped would be a decisive bombardment, prodigious firing all last night. The Spanish general, it seems, has altered his opinion of the rock, and it seems too hard of digestion, though, he has a good stomach to it. Yet he is too impatient to wait two years to eat a passage to us that way. Another contemporary account acknowledged that from this point, it might rightly be said that ours was a gunner's war. We could do nothing but receive the enemy's fire and return it. The Spaniards did great damage to the northern part of the town. The affluent Villa Vieja, and a hundred houses were by that means laid in rubbish. After siege the ruins were removed to create present-day casemates. Despite the structural damage there were few casualties. The greater concern was the number of men the British had available to man the guns. 
repair the damage to the fortifications and serve on sentry duty. This proved to be a major problem for the garrison. The Spanish bombardment continued for 10 days. In his entry for the 24th of March, S.H. noted, Last three days very heavy rains and some wind. The terrible weather caused great problems for the besiegers in the trenches beneath the rock, and the Spanish had to ease their bombardment. A Spanish official journal published in Madrid in 1727 highlights the problems the besiegers were suffering and the frustrations. Desertion becomes very considerable, the troops greatly diminish by sickness. Some fresh troops are coming from Malaga to ease those in camp who are greatly fatigued by hard duty. No sally yet made from the town, as the constant rains have hindered the advance of our works and it is supposed they, the British, thought their artillery sufficient to check our progress. We have yet dismounted only three of their cannon on the curtain and deserters say they have not had above 15 men killed yet. Reinforcements arrived during this relative lull in the Spanish bombardment. Much needed reinforcements arrived in Gibraltar. On 7 April the 25th and 34th regiments arrived with a 480-strong detachment from Menorca. Then on 1 the May the Governor, the Earl of Portmore, arrived with ten companies of the 1st Guards and the 14th Regiment. Room was made for the new reinforcements by moving troops south. Tents were fixed toward Europa Point and three regiments in camp to make room in the town for Middleton and Hazers who disembarked this day. Camp Bay derives its name from this siege, when a regiment was encamped above it. 1727 also saw the destruction of the trees which grew on the rock. Many trees and vines flourished upon the mountain when the Spaniards attempted to surprise the garrison over the Middle Hill, 1704, and many continued till the year 1727, when the regiments who were encamped to the southward had leave to cut some for their firing, which they took in its full latitude and levelled almost the whole. One of the few sorties of the siege occurred just before the arrival of Lord Portmore, an ingenious plan devised by Clayton. It failed due to the gunners acting too soon. This morn, Early two sergeants each having ten men sallied out to the very trenches, called to the enemy and aid them advance. At the same time gave them two volleys which was the signal appointed by the governor who was on the battery to give the word. But the gunman whose business it was to begin, being either drunk or mad or both, over-eager fired away without the sign, and so spoiled the project. The sergeants did their duty well and alimed the whole army in trenches, so that there was beating to arms immediately, which was what we wanted, for the when they had been formed in a body then our guns should have done great execution, but the gunners' rashness let them know the stratagem so they dispersed second heavy bombardment by the 7th of May de las Torres was ready to launch another heavy bombardment. This caused major damage to the town and batteries, and caused far more British casualties than any earlier point in the siege. S.H. Recorded in his journal, the 26th of April, O.S. By break of day the enemy opened all their batteries, and fired till 10, without intermission, wounded several and killed some of our men. A ball came, from their battery, to the new mole, the place where our ships lay, and carried away the mast of a merchantman, which was two miles distance. The 27th of April, O.S., on our part, since yesterday two o'clock, several men killed and wounded, the houses beaten down by the exceeding hot fire, in so much it's scarce possible to walk the streets. A shell broke at the signal house, more went over into the town, and as far as the south port, Willis's batteries in a manner demolished the mole half level with the sea, all the cannon but one at Willis's battery dismounted. They continue their fire with inexpressible fury. The 2nd of May, O.S., the same hot work all night. 2,000 balls and bombs at us, several die of their wounds in our hospital. The damage done to the fortifications in one day could be immense. They dismounted 16 out of the 24 guns at the old mole, and demolished all our batteries in an extraordinary manner. At Willis's all the guns but two dismounted and the cover so beaten down that the men cannot do their duty. 
several gunners and soldiers killed and wounded. The recently arrived British reinforcements, however, allowed the garrison to maintain the batteries, remount the guns and return fire. Lord Portmore, in an attempt to boost the morale and productivity of his infantry-turned labourers, increased their pay from eight pence to a shilling a day. On 15 May, de las Torres, trying to make a point, sent a flag of truce to the governor with a compliment to inform his lordship that they have not begun the siege, and that as yet they were only trying their ordinance, though they yesterday sent us, most part into the town, 119 bombs and near 1500 balls and keep still a most dreadful firing. Nevertheless, the firing from the Spanish guns began to slacken. After several days' continuous fire the Spanish iron cannon began to burst whilst the better brass cannon began to drop at the muzzle from overheating. The besiegers were also beginning to suffer from a lack of supplies owing to the poor Andalusian roads. Another deserter confirms their being in a miserable state of health, with great want of water and provisions. The garrison, on the other hand, had ample supplies of provisions, guns and powder from the sea, and soon began to outgun the Spaniards. The Spanish continued to fire upon Gibraltar, but S.H. wrote, We laugh at them for fools to throw away their powder, ball and shells, since they neither fright, kill or hurt us. End of hostilities. Frustrated with the Count de las Torres's obstinacy and inability to take his advice, the Spanish senior engineer, Via Boom, had left for Madrid. His proposed overland attack from the north failing, de las Torres asked his remaining engineers for their opinion. Their response was blunt. Had we found ourselves in such a position as to be worthy of being asked our opinion of the enterprise before the siege began, as we are now to be worthy of being consulted by your excellency over its prosecution, we would have voted on nothing more than a diversionary tactic overland. The geography and defences of Gibraltar all combined to make a counter-attack so manifestly unbeatable on 23 June the Spanish offered a truce. This night a colonel of Ireland came to the head of the prince's line and called to let them know he had a letter for Lord Portmore, but the commanding officer let him know unless retired they woud fire at him. All parleys between the two forces were supposed to come by sea. Sometime after the same person came out of the zigzag trenches, beating a chamade and was admitted into the town and delivered Lord Portmore's letters from M. Van der Meer, Minister of the State to the Court of Spain with a copy of the preliminary articles signed by the plenipotentiaries of the several powers of the two alliances for a suspension of arms whereupon his lordship agreed to it and all hostilities ceased on both sides. The next day a colonel from the garrison crossed to San Roque, where a truce was agreed. The Spaniards were to remain encamped outside Gibraltar, but hostilities were to cease. An uneasy truce remained until the end of the Anglo-Spanish War in 1729.